Hello and welcome to the very first Incandescent podcast. I'm Nathan Evans. I shall be your host for the next 30-ish minutes. I'm also editor at Incandescent, who were founded in 2016 by myself and Justin David coming up later in the podcast to shine a light on writers underrepresented in mainstream publishing. Now, as well as producing books, we produce events in the main, in London, and this podcast aims to not replicate because it's it's impossible to replicate being in the same room, but to give some sense of the experience of our live shows, a sort of soiree in your own living room. So these podcasts will feature archive recordings from past events and new recordings from writers who will be appearing in future events and will be topping and tailing each episode with some words with music. The first one is from our first book, Threads, which was a collaboration between myself and Justin. He gave each of my poems a bespoke photo a graphic setting and for the ebook we also made some films to accompany each of them so this is the soundtrack of one of those films the music was originally written for an old friend shout out to Winifred in the St John's home Oxford and the poem is about a New Year's Eve party Justin and I attended some years back which as it's still almost the start of the year Felt out. Wish lantern. A spark, a click. I left flame to fuel pack, steer clear of fingers and folded paper for a minute more, until my lighter is overheating and your frown deepening. It's not working. But look, no hands. Lamp burns without assistance. As year turns, flaunts its tumescence, and in a slight of time's digits is full of itself as an overheated adolescent. Shall we release it? Your eyes lift, incandescent, and I can't quite meet them over the expectations jostling between us as proud parents at a graduation we loose them in a spotlight of their own making to the night's auditorium. We're not sure whether to laugh or cry as our debutante deviates into next door's tree and, unable to do anything, forget ourselves in fretting over conflagrations and claims until, alone, it wins its freedom and we celebrate its belated ascent. Do you think it'll reach the stars, I ask? Of course, but I must take you on trust. Because our little light is lost behind London rooftops. Our London home, before it sadly closed, was above the Stag Theatre in Vauxhall. We had an array of amazing guests at bold our monthly queer poetry soiree, including Joel Taylor, Keith Jarrett, Richard Scott, John McCulloch and Andrew McMillan. This next one... You know, again, I, the kind of joy of being here um, in this room and in this incredibly kind of supportive environment tonight reminds you of the importance of, of community, I think, um, and of a kind of the collective history of a community and how it's important, I think, to keep telling those stories to, to new generations. Um, which is an impossibly grand introduction for poem that can't live up to it. Um, but I'll have a go. Um, this is just called Blood. We could be gathered for the reading of a will, each of us wanting to learn what it is we have inherited from the one who loved or did not love us. The nurse calls me in for bloods, says she could get it from a stone, wraps my upper arm, taps the inside of my elbow as though it is a chunk she's trying to coax sap from. I close my eyes and when I open them it's done, sitting mottled in its canister, 
And there are the questions to be answered, yes. I know the risks associated, and yes, once, yes, I did ask, positive, no protection. When I leave, I feel a dread moving in that will not lift for two weeks, settling down to the front of my skull until the text comes through and I am light again having put my ear to the dense secrets of my blood and heard nothing but the curious weight which has been passed down through the generations of this family. To know how close to us the dead are sitting and to believe we honour them best by living. That was Andrew McMillan reading Blood from his collection Playtime, published by Cape, which won the inaugural Polari Prize in 2019. Our next writer was shortlisted for the Polari Prize in 2022 for a dress book published by us. Here he is reading from what would become the opening section of that mosaic novel. It was first published as part of our mainstream anthology, a collection of diverse stories which featured emerging writers alongside established authors such as Kerry Hudson, Kit Deval, Paul McVeigh and Neil Bartlett. Hello everybody. One of the many things that I love about being part of this anthology is that cover graphic behind me because it reminds me that that word mainstream, which I've hated all my life because it's a shorthand way of telling people that some people matter and other people don't, that word mainstream can be altered by taking action and replaced with the word stream, which is fluid and irrigates and is delightful. Um, I think the division between mainstream and stream happens in many ways. For all of us in this room, it can be imposed from outside, but often we internalize that imposition. We create our own exclusion from the mainstream and we can and must abolish that. My story is a story I never thought I'd tell anyone. It happens in 1974, and the important thing about 1974 is that Neil was 15, and in August of 1974, he was picked up by a man called John uh, in the toilets at Waterloo Station. John was working that day, and so we couldn't have sex but he gave me his phone number and invited me back to his house. I didn't really know what that meant because I'd had lots of sex, but never in a house. I decided to phone John because it's 1974. Many of you are too young to know about this. That meant that I had to get on my bike, cycle across town so that no one who knew my parents would say, we saw Neil in the phone box at the end of your road, but to go to the phone box which was furthest away from where we lived, hide my bike in a patch of long grass and press my coin into a hot little slot. And then, it's easy, he's telling me, if the trains from where you live or go through to Waterloo, he's saying, then all you have to do is change at Clapham Junction. Look up on the boards, he says. Look up and find a train to Twickenham. And then, once you're safely on board, just sit tight and count six stops. Get off, the, get off cross the road. I'll be there in my car. And he's right. It is easy to start with. Walking towards him across the road outside the station is fine, but then when I climb into the car, the strap on the seat belt is hot, like skin, and also I can feel John looking at me. I need to get something in between his face and mine, and so I stare straight out through the windscreen and start talking about school, about the train, and all the time I can see the sunshine outside. 
It's putting hard white edges around things and insisting that this is all actually happening. I can remember shifting in my seat to try and hide myself. I can remember my shirt sticking to my back. We turn left. There's a curve in the road lined with houses and then there's a dual carriageway. There are some bright dusty trees close by the road, traffic lights, and now we're turning left again because the light's gone green. And then suddenly there's a plane, a plane so close overhead that it seems to fill the whole of the windscreen. I dark, but John laughs. He tells me that his house here in Twickenham is right under the Heathrow flypath. Sometimes, he says, there are great queues of the things, whole rows of planes hanging up above his house like giant birds. But you get used to the noise. Then we turn left and right. And John says, this is just round the back of where he lives. And before I'm quite ready, the car is parked. First, we're ducking under some kind of wooden arch or pergola, and then we're going onto a lawn that's dotted with young trees, and there's a neighbour doing watering with a hose. Because of the sunlight, the water turns into a spray of something else. Diamonds, I think they are. And this neighbour is waving, and he says, Hello. But John doesn't miss a step. He waves right back as if all of this sunshine and me, 15-year-old me, walking just two paces behind him, is all absolutely ordinary. And I suppose I must have been looking down at my feet when he did that because I'm noticing right now that the path across John's front lawn is made up of exactly the same sort of concrete slabs that we have in our front garden path at home which also seems impossible. We turn left. There are shrubs and flowers, hydrangeas, geraniums, and now I must be looking up again because I can see that John's front door is painted black. John unlocks the door and then he stands aside. There's a step you have to take, he says, and it's right. he's right. There's a sort of step. You have to step out up and over something to get inside John's house, a sort of raised threshold. And I can see this, but my feet won't move, except that now John is saying, you go first, and I'm saying, thank you. Inside, everything is dark. It's a bit too dark after all that dazzle and the sparkling water falling over that neighbour's flowers and I can't quite make things out. I can see a dining table with too many chairs and also some sort of a big wooden chest or cabinet, something very large and locked looking, but I don't ask. I mean, I don't ask for any explanations and then the noise of John putting down the car keys makes me come right back to myself. He goes first up the stairs. On the landing, there's the bathroom. John points that out in case I need it, I suppose. And then there's his spare room, the one we never went in. And then here at the end of the landing is the door to John's bedroom. Everything is white. White walls, white wardrobe doors, and there's a mirror that seems to have me already trapped inside it. Everything is a bit too close for comfort now we're in here and it feels like our two bodies fill up the room entirely. There are some thin white curtains across the window by the bed, I notice, and they're moving very, very slowly. I can see fingers undoing buttons, but I'm not sure if this is John undoing me or me undoing him. Now... According to the mirror, we're taking off our trousers and at this point I have to stop and turn away because John is bending over and taking off everything and that is something else that I've never, ever seen before. 
I can feel a burning on my face and a spasm somewhere in my throat. And now I can feel the bed sheet. It's very cool and it's smooth and it's underneath my knees. The curtains are right next to me now. They're easily within reach should I want to stretch out a hand and stroke them. And I can see now that they're so close that they have shadows moving through them in waves. That's because the window itself has been left ajar and their air that's coming in from outside feels sort of warm and cool both at the same time. John starts to touch me on my foot, first of all, because now I'm lying on my back and John is standing at the bottom of the bed and he's looking at all of me, up and down, And I do try and look back at him. I really do try to do that, but I can't because of the burning on my face and because of what's happening in my throat. And so I turn my head and I watch those shadows moving through the curtains instead. They're moving very slowly and the air that is touching them is touching me all over, I realise. And now finally... I do look up at John, and the first thing he does is smile. The first part of our love making, I remember, happened in complete silence. But later on, I think after about 40 minutes, I can hear my 15 year old self starting to make a lot of noise. I make sounds that I don't think I've ever made before and they bewilder me. They arrive in the room without my even being sure that it's my throat that's making them and I think I probably flounder a bit at this point and maybe even call out for help. When this happens, John doesn't stop. He's using his mouth on me now And he's doing it better than anybody ever has before. Somewhere low down inside me, I'm beginning to feel sensations that are too large to stay put. I can feel them getting impatient. They need to be acknowledged somehow. And as my back starts to arch, I realise these feelings or sounds of mine must be rather like those planes that John says are always lining up over his house, except these planes aren't high, they're deep. I start to pant and then, I suppose, I start to sing. John still doesn't stop doing what he's doing but with his spare hand he does reach up and lightly brush two fingers across my opening mouth those fingers slip inside me and he hooks them against my lower teeth and I understand John is reminding me that the bedroom window is still open and that the water may still be turning into a spray of diamonds above the flowers just across the way, but he isn't telling me to stop. He is telling me to keep going quietly. He is telling me I can signal to those waiting planes any time I want to and bring them in to land. He is telling me that nothing needs to stop me now, least of all myself. He is telling me that at last the sunshine and my throat and my voice are mine. Neil, he says, not looking up from his work. Neil. I come and just listen to the sounds that I'm making through John's fingers. Long, straying notes played pianissimo right up high on the neck of a double bass. They are wonderful. Wonderful. 
Thank you. That was Neil Bartlett reading from his short story Twickenham at the launch of Mainstream at Above the Stag Theatre in 2021. As you could hear from Neil's voice, it was it was quite an emotional experience for him and for the audience. Neil does that, and it's been wonderful for us to to hear how affected readers have been by his address book. And we're very much looking forward to working with Neil on his next book, but I'm going to let Justin David tell you all about that. Hello, Justin. Hello, Nathan. So tell us about Neil's book. Well, this is one that I'm really excited by. The Disappearance Boy was um, one of Neil's previous books and one of my favourites. Um, and despite the fact that it was only published quite recently by Bloomsbury... 2013, yeah? Something like that, yeah. It's actually one of his lesser-known works. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, you know, we're going to be able to give it the attention that it deserved. After the huge success of Address Book... Um, I was very keen to get my hands on more of Neil's work to publish, so it was a gift when we heard that it had fallen out of print, and we've managed to get our, our hands on the rights to publish it, to republish it. So just tell us a little bit about the book. It's set around the time of the Queen's coronation in um, the magical world of variety theatre on the south coast of England, and it's about a literally a literal small boy who triumphs over a metaphorical Goliath um, and I hope in this story that we many of us can find the strength to survive our current tempest oh give me strength we need strength don't we just right now but that's not our that's November so that's not our next book our next book is in May <gasps> And even more exciting, I mean, May literally is just round the corner, uh -huh. isn't it? Yes, it's my book, Tales of the Suburbs. And that is a prequel. Oh, yes, so it's a prequel um, to two of my other books, Kissing the Lizard and The Pharmacist, mm -hmm. and obviously it includes lots of the same characters. So, Gloria. Yes, Gloria's oh, coming back, good. she's in very fine good. form. Um and we're going back to, to Jamie's childhood um, when he was at school. So that's the 1980s. Yeah, around about the time of the, the AIDS crisis and um, that awful piece of legislation that the, the Tory government brought in, Section 28. Right. But we should stress that it's a, it's an, uh, it's a joyful, optimistic, There's lots fun of work. joy in it. It's very funny. It's quite soap operatic, really, isn't <laughs> yes. it? Yes. Yes, it's got big soapy vibes. Um, and funnily uh, enough, we... We have some soap operatic endorsements. Don't indeed, we? indeed. I was thrilled um, to get some endorsements from uh, some big name soap stars, mm -hmm. Annette Badland and Mitchell. Both from EastEnders. Both from EastEnders, and perhaps not quite so soapy, but um, in the same universe, Patricia Routledge. Patricia Routledge. No, no, no less. So, Nathan, tell us about what's going on for Incandescent in terms of live events this year. Well, Justin, I'm going to Leeds Library on well, the Leeds. 9th. I love the accent. I haven't been to Leeds in such a long time. Anyway, I'm off to the library on the 9th of February. I'm taking part in a panel called Queer Publishing Now. So, Punch also, title. it is. Uh, also on the panel, we have Jack from Cypher. Oh, Press, love Jack from Cypher. Another queer independent publisher. Great. Ray from The Bookish Type, which is a queer independent Super. bookshop in Leeds, and it's being chaired by Stu Hennigan. Love Stu. Who is also a uh, fabulous author. And then on March the 30th, Bold is back. Wow! I've been having withdrawal symptoms know, it's, been, it's been a long time, hasn't it? Yeah. So um, we are back at the Betsy Trotwood. Oh, lovely venue. Very different vibe to um, above the Stag Theatre. But we went to the Betsy, didn't we, for Sophia Blackwell's book launch? We did, yeah. And we loved the venue, also loved Sophia's book. book. Yes. It's um, the Poetry Writer's Handbook, which is it's fantastic. It is that's just... A, that's a sort of sister volume to the Writers and Artists Exactly, book. exactly. 
um, it's just the sort of book that I wish that I had read like 10 years ago when mm. I was just starting out in, in poetry. It covers everything from performing through publishing and it's so engaging and entertaining. Mm. Um, so it's great. Thoroughly recommend that if you are a poet. Um, anyway, back to the Betsy. So we're going to be there. We have Lisa Lux yes. and Kostya Salakis yep. with us and we're going to have our very first open mic. Oh, people have been waiting for this. I know, they keep asking about this. So here, here's here's your opportunity. Um, tickets are going to be on Eventbrite. We're not, uh, they're not quite there yet, but keep an eye out on our socials. And I'll put it in that. the newsletter, Nathan. Great. So um, thank you, Justin. Thank you. And we'll be back uh, with this podcast. We're aiming to drop a podcast on the fourth Thursday of every month. So keep an eye out for the next one um, around the 23rd of February, something like that. I'm going to wrap up the January podcast with another musical piece. This was again recorded at Above the Stag Theatre and was, in fact, the very last poem performed there. Funnily enough, it's a piece about disappearing queer space. It's performed with violinist Kate Conway, who I met more decades ago than probably either of us would care admit to, when we were both playing with London Gay Symphony Orchestra. But this is the first time we've ever performed at a ownership. We who never felt at home, at home followed hazard tape roads to a green for go city where we could finally belong in our own body. Made up and magpied, we rode underground carriages to trash palaces, substations and ghettos of our generation, camped hours in star-crossed gutters to darken doorways, descend stairways to havens where flowers not yet in bloom walled rooms we wanted to live in, learning to dance on our own two feet, glitching the beats like dirty CDs until third pint streamed, pelvis intervened and we murdered floors in light shows, singing rainbows, not blue tones, our every limb scrawling and tapping into pheromones sweating from congenital ceilings we were blitz club and caravan dionysian apollonian hunting cigarette smoke undergrowth for hyacinths and gathering them in form unexpected, unfiltered. Our phones for exchanged numbers, not Ubers. We oystered uncapitalized zones to first homes shared with chosen sisters, brothers, others. Our first seconds always there, marvelous mother. Misfit until they were not. And now we are permitted a place at the table to order from the same menu, to have any petaled peccadillo beamed to our own bedroom. And only memories mirable luxury flats, cross rail tracks, and the city in stars again, and the young heal their own way as we before them. And with those three taps of my heels, I'm going to leave you with some words from a queer poet past. This is the last poem in the anthology 100 Queer Poems, edited by Andrew McMillan and Mary Jean Chan. It's by Langston Hughes. Final Curve. 
when you turn the corner and you run into yourself then you know that you have turned all the corners that are left <laughs>